She says, well, the truth is, is that I've been watching y'all for about four years. And uh, I just wanted to make sure you did what you said you did. And you do. And we would like you to turn Luck Ranch here in Spicewood, Texas, Willie Nelson's place, into a regenerative agriculture ranch. Whoa. And you just, yeah. you know, it's 500 acres and you're like, what? And she goes, and we also want to take your message nationally and, and Willie can be your spokesperson. And we're just, you're like, that's when you're like, so what? <laughs> and Orion Weldon, welcome to Carbon Cowboys Conversations. Thanks for having us. Thanks. My name's Peter Bick. So I am excited to be talking to you guys and gals for a whole lot of reasons, but I got to ask, we're in a building under construction there, so what's the story? Uh, we are building an addition to our home because we have uh, an eight-month-old and we need some more space. <laughs> and nice. the original cabin, which is right next door, is like a little less than 700 square feet uh, with one bedroom. And so yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, this is a, uh, just five acres of a family-owned land, and it had this small cabin, and we came to help my parents and decided to maybe, you know, cut our teeth on some of the farming that we wanted to do. Right. And then the opportunities just opened up, but, you know, if we're going to, if we're going to stay here and we're going to, you know, have children, <laughs> which he is now sleeping in our little bedroom, <laughs> and we, we need more space, so this is the addition. So tell me the name of your farm. How long have you guys been farming? And then let's go back to, were you born on farms? Is farming where you started? Great, yeah, so our, our farm name is Teta Purezza. Um, and everyone, often, everyone asks how to pronounce it because they usually say Terra Purezza. Um, but it's Italian in origin because we were originally going to start in Italy. And uh, it translates to pure land or pure earth because that is uh, the intentionality behind the farming practices that we use. And uh, we'll, we'll tell a little bit of that, that backstory with the, it, the Italy <laughs> component. Um, so Orion and I didn't come from farming backgrounds. We both um, grew up in suburban neighborhoods, me in New Jersey and Orion in Houston. And we met at Rutgers University, which is where I was getting my degree in dietetics and Orion in conservation ecology, specifically on uh, bird habitat. He was That's doing right. his dissertation. I grew up in New Jersey and uh, working on farms uh, during the summers and just really enjoying that lifestyle, but I definitely was not on track to become a farmer when we met. I was going to become a licensed dietitian and work in hospitals and clinical settings, um, but over time I became disillusioned with the, um, the effects that I could have with that career path and the ability to affect the community nutritional health changes that I really wanted to have uh, in, in my life. and so. In that, I learned about regenerative agriculture. I started going down the rabbit hole of what this means, and it really seemed like this was this was the path that could actually um, increase community health and nutrition. Is actually looking at the soil and the soil health, and in translation, then the nutrient density of the foods. And so I, so I was so like, putting wow, I guess putting human health and soil health and food health, you were starting to put the pieces together. And you thought you'd have a bigger impact if you got into how the food was produced rather than s suggesting to people what they should eat. Is that? Exactly. You, you put it in more concise words for me. <laughs> no, that's, 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 all. that's very cool that you wanted to go further upstream, as they say. And, yeah. yeah, exactly. And, nice. And Ryan, birds? Uh, started off with marine biology, uh, oh, okay. and then I got hooked on birds. And um, yeah, I'm all of my graduate work was on uh, habitat requirements for threatened and endangered species. And the more you go down that rabbit hole or the more upstream you go, the more you realize that the entirety of the landscape change is the major driver of all this. So even if we understand specific habitat requirements, if there's none of the landscape left to create that habitat, you know, plus all the downstream effects on my original passion, marine systems yeah. Um, yeah. led me back to regenerative agriculture. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm amazed at how farming affects oceans, right? Yeah. There's all these yeah. dead zones around the, around the world where rivers full of you know, stuff that was put on farms that really is more of a pollution than it is a, a, a healing thing. 
all of a sudden it's killing lots of fish. It's, it's, it's like the, the Gulf of Mexico has a huge dead zone at the end of it, which is just insane. And so it is farmers. It, I, I, I've, I'm, I'm astounded at how powerful farming is for the health of the planet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and, and the health of all the species, yeah. And so that's, uh, that, you know, it becomes glaringly obvious to the point where anything you're pretty much studying in any natural system, you, you, you can't ignore farming after a certain while. And right. um, I, I started chewing on that, being like, well, I, you know, I, I wasn't planning on being a farmer. But I was super passionate about affecting change. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so m the more and more I got closer and closer to my mentors and my idols, I thought, man, they, this is my idol. And mm -hmm. even they're not like affecting the change that I want to in right. my lifetime. So it was a tough choice. But I started you know, thinking, okay, maybe I'll, maybe I'll come become a farmer and a rancher. Um, and it, but it was a secret dream. I, I wouldn't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. um, until our first date. Until I met <laughs> Tina. I, Really? And then, yeah. And then so like Tina's the first person I told that this was actually becoming my dream because she's like, well, what do you want to do after your dissertation? I'm like, I really like this girl. I'm going to tell her the truth. And I'm like, actually, I want to start a farm. And she's like, yeah, me too. And I'm like, no, no, hold on, hold on. Like, like specifically a regenerative agriculture farm. And she's like, oh my God, me too. And I was like, that's it. That's it. First, that's it. first date? <laughs> first date? First date. First date. First, yeah. Like we're on our way to a dance and that's our conversation on the car and like that was it the rest is history did you really like think to yourselves at that point there he is there she is this is gonna work did you go that far that fast or you go well that's a good start i didn't i didn't go to like i'm gonna marry this girl but i'm like this is awesome <laughs> yeah <laughs> so. it was more like date number three that we talked about marriage <laughs> okay well that's pretty quick yeah that's, that's yeah. pretty quick yeah we yeah. We moved in with each other after two weeks, and then three months later, we did actually get married. So. so is where you are where your parents were living? Is it the same piece of property, or is it, in, is it other... Like, where, where are you specifically on Earth right now? We are, we're in Spicewood, Texas, which is 45 minutes uh, west of Austin. Got it. And Got it. Uh, we live on five acres here, and this is the land that Orion's parents own. Um, but we now, we farm on multiple campuses in addition to these five acres. Gotcha. But this is where it started. This is where your farming experiment started. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, it, it's, it's super humble. It, it started with like a 20 foot by 20 foot garden plot. Yeah. And we were so earnest and we were so jazzed that we're like, we're there with just hand tools digging the thing and like, but knew we had this huge monumental yeah. dream that we were going to persevere through. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it, it's worked. Um, but it was, it was a little ridiculous. It was a little silly how small it started. <laughs> and how, how, how quickly from that small 20 by 20 start was it to where you were selling food to people? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I mean, we were selling some of the products from that garden to our what became our partner restaurant yeah. uh, pretty quickly because, um, as all restaurants know, especially fine dining, getting high quality fresh ingredients is their biggest challenge. They kind of they 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 need it, um, and sure they can order from you know any of the big industrial food delivery services, but like, let's say they want to have nasturtium blossoms on their plate or hyacinth bean blossoms or squash blossoms or any sort of like really fresh greens um like th it's really difficult for them and so even out of a 25 20 foot plot we could grow a lot that they were having trouble getting and that um as we now talk about uh partnerships are what make or break a farm um and they were our first and so we really showed up for them and they put in a good word for us in all of the future partnerships. Mm -hmm. So immediately you guys are actually in business, which is pretty phenomenal. And then you started producing a lot more food and, and someone was scouting you. We're going to get to that story now and then we're going to go back. OK, so but someone's scouting you. Who, what's going on? Where is where are you guys getting your name made with the food you're producing? And what food are you producing at this point, this early iteration? So it was quick, we quickly found out that as we were getting these partnerships and talking to restaurants that there was a, a huge need for pasture-raised meats. And we knew that we wanted to get into pasture-raised meats 
um, already because of the rotational grazing and the impact on the pasture land that, that was like the, the actual intent. Um, but beyond that, just there, there weren't enough people producing that kind of quality meat. And so we, we started raising uh, meat chickens. We already had the egg laying hens. That's what we cut our teeth on. Um, but we specifically went into pastured poultry and pastured pork. And that's the majority of what we produce right now. Um, and so we, when we were starting to produce the chicken and the pork, we had our restaurant accounts, but then we also wanted to provide to our local community. And we were considering going into the Austin area farmer's markets because one didn't exist here in Spicewood. We did not have a farmer's market for our town. Uh, and, and we're like, well, the, the, primarily for me, but for both of us, I really wanted to provide my community with high quality nutrition. Instead of going all the way into Austin where there's already three well-established farmer's markets, let's look at starting our own farmer's market here. And that's what we did. And so we created in 2017, we started, and that was an adventure in its, on its own um, to learn how to create a farmer's market in an unincorporated area because um, nobody knows how to do it and we were kind of the first to do it but we did successfully and I mean, we've not grown. in the nation but like we would call the representative of the state yeah. and be like how do we permit this farmers market and, like, and they don't know oh wow okay. um, but we, yeah. we figured it out um, and we grew it was just us and a baker and that's how we started the farmers market we were just two booths um, but you have to build it and then people will come and, and it did. So we are now a 40 booth farmer's market. 45. 45 booth yeah. farmer's market. And we have live music and drinks and it's a great time. I can't but wait to come visit. Yeah. I cannot yeah, wait to come it's, visit. It's, it's really visit. great. It's become like a cornerstone activity for Spicewood. Like everybody comes out to the farmer's market. Okay, so somebody was scouting you at that farmer's market. Right, so we didn't know this, but we had an incognito customer. <laughs> and uh, there was one day that, so the pandemic hit in March, that's actually when Leonis was born as well. So it was a crazy time. Um, he was born March 15th, right? When it was, it all started. Yeah. He's our, we call him our pandemic baby. It'll be a good story. Um, <laughs> so so we have a baby at home. I'm, I'm not doing as much of the farm work. Orion's running everything single-handedly. It's a crazy time. And uh, what has been a blessing in disguise about coronavirus for farmers like us and us, um, we, our demand has quadrupled, quintupled. We cannot keep product on the shelves anymore. Everybody has gained a new awareness and appreciation for local food systems, which is amazing. Because human um, health, food, keeping yourself healthy, not getting the disease means you got to be healthier. And if you're going to be eating healthier food, you're going to be healthier. And people are making that connection and you guys are profiting from it. So many of the farmers that we speak to have the same story, exact same story. Yeah, yeah. well, especially when the... Uh, larger meat packing operations started going down um people started like hoard buying meat uh and it you know it, it was it was a, quite a challenge because you know we were disappointing a lot of customers yeah. because we didn't have five times as much product because did you limit you know, did you set a limit on what you could sell to people so that you could still in the beginning we, yeah we started rationing like you can only get two chickens a week or you can only get three dozen eggs for example right, right. And then that even dropped to one dozen eggs for a while. Wow. We would open the market with a line of 20 families. 20. 20 families waiting in line ridiculous. at 10 a.m. to get. I would take pictures <laughs> and I'd be like, this is bananas. <laughs> yeah, it was, just... it was crazy. In all of that, we also created a pre-order system because in order to help us ration things for people, you know, instead of standing in a line, you know, and like just missing out on product, we, we had a website built and we did a pre-order system. And we also offered deliveries during the beginning when we didn't, everybody didn't know the nature of this virus and what was safe and what wasn't. So we started a delivery service, but it was brand new and we had some technical difficulties with the system. And so this incognito customer comes up to us at our farmer's market booth and she goes, I put in an order on your pre-order website and I, I set it for delivery, but I haven't heard back. And we're like, oh, we're so sorry. We're experiencing some issues and we felt really bad. Um, and we're like, what, or Orion's there at the time. I'm not, and I'm home with the baby. And he's, he asks, so what, what's your name? And I'll t let you take over from there. And she says, my name's, my name's Annie Nelson. I'm, I'm Willie's wife. And I go, oh, great. And I move on <laughs> and, and she's like, you, you know, <laughs> Willie. And I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I realize now I played it too cool, you know, <laughs> and so. Well, because you don't want to make a big deal, right? You're like, okay, yeah. Perfect. And I said, you know, well, I'll, I'll look into it myself. And she said, well, I mean, just, you know, whatever, take your time. And I said, okay. And, and she said, well, we're actually starting a garden ourselves and, and we'd like it to be regenerative. And so 
um, you know, maybe you could come by and give us some advice. And, you know, someone of that stature doesn't casually, well, maybe they do, casually invite you to come look at their garden. And so um, I, that was my first hint that like something might be up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so she gives me her personal cell phone number and we start texting. And I said, well, my wife and I are actually a team. We work really well bouncing ideas off each other. She has insights and intuitions that I don't. Uh, can I bring my wife? And we also have a newborn child. And it turns out that uh, Annie Nelson is grandbaby crazy. So I really think the only reason we're here is because we had a baby. <laughs> That's great. That's great. That works. Yeah, it was great. Totally, yeah. totally. And so we, are, we, we go over there and she's showing us around the garden and um, we start sitting around this lovely little garden picnic table. And uh, she says, well, the truth is, is that I've been watching y'all for about four years. And uh, I just wanted to make sure you did what you said you did. And you do. And we would like you to turn Luck Ranch here in Spicewood, Texas, Willie Nelson's place, into a regenerative agriculture ranch. Whoa. And you just, yeah. you know, it's 500 acres and you're like, what? And so, like, we're, you know, we're stupefied. And she goes, and, and we also want to take your message nationally and and willie can be your spokesperson and we're you're like that's when you're like so what? yeah uh and so yeah it uh we you know then started continuing to talk there about like well what because we didn't you know, like what does that mean like what are you asking for like are we do you want us to just build it for you um do you want us to move our operations and so like these are the th natural things that you go through um, yeah, and it, you know, went well, and we started moving the pigs there, and the hens will be there soon, and then the meat chickens will start soon. Um, but the real goal is the potential for luck to become both a hub for the selling of local products uh, that are as regenerative or organic as can be, uh, as well as the future of research operations and potential partnerships with the Rodale Institute and... Um, other other big hitters. That's awesome. So, are you guys uh, doing like soil sampling, baseline sampling at at Luck Ranch, and what's been produced at Luck Ranch up to now? What was going on on that 500 acres up to Annie coming to you guys in March of 2020? Not not much. Uh, they it's a it's a horse rescue ranch right now, and so they they have 70 rescued paint horses, and they have their paddocks, and then the rest of it is really just before the Nelsons had it, chronically overgrazed classic Texas hill country land that has a lot of soil erosion, a lot of caliche subsoil exposed, um, a lot of brush, a lot of cedar, um, ash juniper. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it wasn't a very productive land. It was, it was uh, they had the luck town for the set of redheaded stranger way back when, and that's just, it's where they live. And so it's not, it was not like an agriculturally pr producing, piece of land the I mean the 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 power of it for the events that they've held has been amazing you know the the um, farm aid concerts the luck reunion other concerts has been just such a gift to everyone especially if you're just as passionate about music yeah um, and they're passionate about farmers they've been trying to help farmers for 30 years uh, with farm aid and yeah that land has been amazing for that purpose. Um, but as far as like actual farm products, um, it's just the rescue operation, which is great in itself. Um, but it's, you know, it's tough even ranching when, you know, the, the, the legacy effects of overgrazing are just as present now as they were 40 years ago. Yeah. Uh, because rebuilding soil, you know, previously took millennia. And right. I think that's uh, what a lot of people just don't understand is that, you know, we, um, have a lot of uh, shifting, what's in, in, in the ecological world, it's called shifting baselines, where mm -hmm. we humans are used to uh, operating with what we think is normal based on how we were raised or what we remember from our teenage years and things. Um, but if you, in your childhood or teenage years, already started with highly degraded land, that's what you think nature is. Right. And so, and that, that's, uh, I, that's not what nature really wants to be. Yeah, and well, I mean, we can get into the philosophy of like nature wanting or anything, but it's like what the, the productivity and the numbers of wildlife that used to be, you tell people and they do not believe you. 
when you talk about passenger pigeons in the billions, they do not believe you. Yeah. When you talk about wading birds or cormorants or the numbers of bison or elk or pronghorn running across the plains and the predators, like they don't believe you when you when you quote the numbers that are in the accounts of people. When you think about scale, right? You started with 20 by 20 feet. You've got five acres to work. I assume you guys are working a, a good portion of the five acres that you're on. You've been using most of it. And that's with laying hens, broiler chickens, and pork, pasture pork. Pork is not here. It's on our other campuses. Are you leasing other land? When you say campuses, is that you're leasing other farms? Yes. So, so Luck Ranch with the Nelsons is one, um, yeah. and then the other one is Shield Ranch, which is in Dripping Springs in Austin. And that area, so we've, what we have um, considered a strong suit of ours is we, we have thrived by developing strong partnerships with landowners, with restaurants, with uh, Whole Foods, other, um, uh, we also partner with a grain mill, we get their castaway seeds as cover crops. Uh, and, and through those partnerships, we've been able to take advantage of mutually beneficial relationship dynamics. And so with the landowners, it's a lease, but it's actually a cost-free lease because we are providing ecological services for them as the landowner. And in exchange for those benefits, we are allowed to do our production on their land. So you've convinced landowners that the benefits you're going to bring to their land is worth more than what they would charge you for a lease. Absolutely. Do you have that in a written contract? Is that a handshake? How does that work for you all that way? It depends on the family and the style of that family or that business. Um, most, all but one, have been uh, handshake classic Texas deals. Um, and then one, our biggest one, is that family is very careful. Um, many of them are lawyers themselves. And so we have a very specific drawn out lease agreement contract with them. Um, but, you know, we developed it together and it's, we're not doing anything differently with the handshake deals than we are with them, it's just one's on paper. Right. And I'm sure having that on paper will be very handy moving down the road. So you guys are scaling up right now. You're, you're increased, you're, you're growing. So I'm looking at two human beings and I know a baby's asleep across that wall right there. Do you have other people working with you? Do you have, uh, do you have employees now? Um, how, how are you scaling up on that part? I would say that, that right now we have two other full-time employees in addition to us, and then we have now three other part-time employees, and then we have a smattering of volunteers that are pretty dedicated. Oh, wow. Yeah, we get uh, small, small local farms get a lot of requests for volunteer time. Um, Which is great. And it, it's, we can go down a rabbit hole of volunteerism, but it's, it's a complicated thing because most people are genuinely looking for an experience for themselves or maybe for their family, which is incredibly valuable, right? Um, but we're not a rescue farm. We're not a hobby farm. Like, we have to make money. Our time is in short supply. So Teaching volunteers actually takes a lot of time. Huge amount of time. Huge amount of time. Especially because we're not, we're not a farm that, you know, you just you go out and feed the animals and it's a routine every single day. There are so many moving parts and the training takes a long time. Yeah. Uh, and that's, you know, one of the things we get into as part of our <coughs> workshops in that, you know, we, we think that this should be the future of agriculture. But we are also pretty honest and frank that these methods take more labor. You know, we are, we are not a CAFO operation where everything is automated in a big grow house and that like one or two people can can feed and care for 10,000 chickens. You know, it's just uh, when you when you have mobile coops, uh, it takes more labor. When you are moving the pigs and the sheep and the cattle once a week or daily, uh, you know, there, there, there's no robot yet that is going to move those cows, but those robots are coming and, and we can talk about that. But uh, yeah, like it, it takes more labor and more time. And to me, that's good because we need more people working on the land. Um, I think the experiment for cheap food created a situation where you, Tina, realized people's health is being heavily impacted by the quality of food they're eating and the low quality of food they're eating. We need more people growing more healthy food. I like more people working on the land myself. I think 
I hope it's a growing, growing industry. And now, are there other farmers, other couples that you've run into that are on a similar path to you all? Or do you guys feel like you're all alone out there? Do you, do you get to talk to folks and learn from folks? What's your, what's your own sort of learning society? Yeah, it's a good question. There, there are many, many people passionate about this, which is a great thing. Uh, the thing that is challenging is how to do that in our modern economy when there is a surfeit of cheap food. Um, because making a profit in this way is not easy. You know, we, Tina and I have, have threaded multiple needles very carefully to not over leverage ourselves and bury ourselves. And for any small to medium sized farm nowadays, usually there's somebody earning money off farm somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and, and so that, you know, w the, the moment Tina and I both went full time on the farm was a huge moment because she had been working at a cashier for Whole Foods. We had both been servers at our partner restaurant. Like you just need cash flow. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that was a big deal when she put in her, you know, month long notice to the restaurant to be like, all right, in one month, it's Orion and I are full time on the farm. That's and that deal. was like, <gasps> here we go. <laughs> what are you all doing about insurance? If I might ask, because that's that's a limiting factor for farmers I know who would love to quit their off farm job if they could. But that insurance keeps them at their off farm job, I've heard a number of times. We never carried health insurance through any of our jobs um, as a server or at, you know, working at Whole Foods. If you're not full time, you don't get those kind of benefits. So we were already you know, just piecing it together on our own. And thankfully, you know, the healthcare marketplace was, in, was available and we applied for that and we've just been working on that. And then in terms of the business, we also have general liability and workers comp. So anything that's related to the farm work that might come up we do have full coverage for ourselves and our employees. Yeah. yeah. And I think, um, you know, people get sheepish about their personal situations. Um, but Tina and I, you know, are, are very frank where it's like, in a lot of ways, we were very lucky. You know, like, we don't have a mortgage to pay because we're living in this tiny seven foot, 700 square foot cabin on my parents' land. That's huge. Yeah. That's not lost on us. When we started, we were making very little money. Um, and so that's why we could qualify for the healthcare marketplace. And that's where our insurance came from. And that has worked out you know, for us. And as we earn higher and higher income, we will you know, basically be paying for more insurance on our own. And we acknowledge that. Um, and so yeah, the, the pressures of, of health insurance, of rent or mortgage, of land access, we say that a farm is not sustainable unless it is financially sustainable. And those deep, the details of those questions of like, you know, what I, I call the, the structural foundation of your life of like, how do you make money? How do you, you know, do all these things are huge. And mm -hmm. we, we wouldn't have done it without, I would say three things. One, having, you know, just these five acres where we're not paying rent or mortgage. Mm -hmm. Two, subsidies for things like health insurance. And three, the partnerships that we've formed, mainly the partner restaurant that allows us to process our chickens and small animals uh. um, and you know, gives us a place to sell our meats directly. Like those, those three things, that's why we exist. Yeah. I would actually, I would, add, I would add a fourth, and that's community, um, which includes family and friends, because in addition to just helping to build the farm, it really takes a village to build a farm. So we've had so many wonderful, so much wonderful support from those people in our life who come to like help us dig holes for the fence or anything like that. But also like childcare, for example. I mean, we've only had our, our baby for eight months, but um, having Orion's parents jump in and take care of him instead of having to, uh, you know, look at expensive daycare options um, so that we can both keep working and building the farm, that's, it's monumental. That right there, uh, you just described what I've learned is pretty normal country community. Right, that's not an unusual situation you just described. Um, families that still live in the same areas, the parents and the grandparents, other community members helping, you would help your neighbor as much as they would help you. All those things are traditional 
in, in the best sense. Um, and, 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 and that's something that I don't have in my city living, really. But we have neighbors and we help each other out. I feel like I'm asking more than they're asking a lot of times. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I want to help, but, you know. Well, I mean, for example, um, we are on a well system. And, you know, well systems have been around for a long time, but they have wearable parts, right? There's like all sorts of like contacts that engage to like run the pump versus, you know, stopping the pump. There's pressure tanks, there's all sorts of stuff. And so when, you know, part of coming onto the land here to like help my parents get set up was some of the equipment where it's like, this stuff is 30 years old. Like this has to be replaced. Mm -hmm. We had the well pump stop and I was a suburban kid. I'd never worked on a well before. I didn't know how that worked. And I've, I now learn and I can do all that stuff. But at the time, we had to take our neighbor's well, hook up, you know, Hose. hoses and all sorts of stuff. And oh, wow. you run into like female to male connector issues. And <laughs> we were like, oh man, because the, you know, the hardware store is 30 minutes down the road. And so you know, we, we got water going because we needed to water the chicken. So yeah. it's, it's not like, oh, you don't go for a shower that day. It's like your animals are going to die. Yeah. Uh, and so the neighbors showed up for us and we used their well. So what's the plan with the Luck Ranch? How involved are the family? You know, how's things getting paid for? How's that all gonna happen? Sure, yeah, so uh, essentially, um, I would say that the two members, all of the members of the family, Willie, Annie, their children, Micah and Lucas, are all passionate about this. Um, Micah, Nelson, uh, has gone down more of the rabbit hole than I think anybody else about everything from like vermicomposting to amendments to the soil, just really digging in. And so we have the most detailed conversations with him. Uh, but you know, the, and, the land belongs to Annie and Willie. And so uh, they, in those negotiations that I mentioned earlier, they decided, well, you know, we don't, we don't need any more name recognition and you two have been busting your butts for years, we think the relationship should be Teta Puretza on Luck Ranch. Oh, wow. And oh, wow. that was the deal where um, they don't charge us for lease of the land because of the benefits we will be bringing, which take a long time, by the way. Like, that's, what, that's one of the biggest messages is that these regenerative systems are based on you know growing seasons and rain. And like, if there's no rain here, for almost a year, because that ha that happens, um, it's going to look pretty bad. In fact, it's going to look much worse before it gets better, because e you know even the most robust native grasses need time to grow. So it takes a long time. But they pretty much are trusting us to our own devices, and we are incredibly differential. And so anything that's new, I'm be like, hey, by the way, this is what we're thinking or this is usually part of our next part of the program, and uh, they have been nothing but excited and enthusiastic, and, it, and when we explain why we're about to do something, they totally get it. Yeah. Uh, but there's no financial support from them. Uh, they're mm -hmm. not, um, well, there's, there's a little bit here and there with equipment and things. Um, yeah. Most, the, the arrangement that we have with both um, Luck Ranch and Shield Ranch is essentially like anything that's permanent infrastructure that's gonna go into the land that increases the land value because it's their land, they need to approve it, and usually either it's a cost share or they fully pay for it. Um, gotcha. Whereas anything that's mobile, the equipment, the animals, the, uh, the feed, all of that is it's part of our business expenses and operations. And so they've been running new water lines for us, these uh, other areas. Uh, and then the part that we've collaborated with Annie is that um, using technology for some of these autonomous systems um, she is just as excited at it as we are, and so we're jumping in together on these autonomous robotic chicken coops, which is like a teaser line for an announcement that's coming next year. Okay, I can I can I can picture that, and I can see that working. Um, what about livestock? What about grazing? And and how are you moving? Are you go getting into that? How are you moving your sheep? And are you getting into cattle? What where are you all at with that? And is is that going to be on Luck Ranch? Will that be happening there? Because we're in this, this area, and the reason that we're doing regenerative agriculture is because this land needs a lot of regeneration. And it needs a lot of regeneration before it can support ruminants, and specifically the larger ruminants. So we're working our way up, and that is the goal. So we're starting with the chickens and the pigs to do a hard pasture reset, to really dump a lot of nutrients in the land. We do cover crops, native seed 
um, spreading. And then we, we let it rest and then we'll start to bring in the sheep. And then after several growing seasons and looking at the land saying, are we ready? We are looking forward to bringing on cattle and eventually bison as well. Actually, Peter, this, what, the question you're asking now, I think is one of the most important subjects in the potential for regenerative agriculture. Because, you know, if we're, if we're, re if we're being real, we are trying to regenerate land and people say, oh, rotational, high density grazing, holistic management, all these things. But what do you do if the land that you are trying to regenerate doesn't have enough forage for the sheep or the cattle? How, how are you gonna graze the sheep and the cattle if it's almost bare rock? A lot of people just supplement hay and they start, they start moving the animals and they put hay out, but that's incredibly cost inhibitive, especially if you're a farmer who doesn't have outside income. Hay is very expensive, especially hay that's produced without adding extra strain on the land. It's kind of wherever they it, made right? it. Yep. You, yep. You have to irrigate it. There's, I mean, finding pesticide-free hay. Um, I looked into that when we were yeah. thinking about uh, some Dexter cows out here. Yeah. It, it not only is it so expensive, it's incredibly rare. Um, and so, and it, it's usually coming from another state, Yeah, you know, so there's like all the transportation costs and it's like, this is exactly the opposite of what oh, we're trying to do. Yeah. And so we decided to, you know, uh, you know, one, because we didn't have the, the huge amount of capital to feed hay for two years before, you know, you can start grazing on your own. Uh, we decided, well, why, why are there not grasses here now? One, the topsoil has been eroded away because all of the previous plants holding it in place are now gone. Um, but two, the nutrient cycling has ceased because the ground is so dry. Yeah. Um, and so getting nutrients back into the land and restarting those systems and getting that soil covered is the first step before you can really start utilizing it for any ruminant sheep and cattle. And that's why we use the pigs and chicken first. It's a very intentional pro, um, tool to restart growing your own forage. And that is needed before you can even think about sheep or cattle. And I, and I think it's important as well in terms of like the human diet. We don't all want to eat lamb and beef all day long, right? Like chicken and pork are a big part of our diet. And I think they're often a little too overlooked in the, in the conversation about holistic management and grazing right. because... Are we just going to say, okay, pigs and chickens are always going to be a negative impact kind of style of raising? Like pasture pork, uh, there are very few farms doing pasture pork well, where it's not just, you know, a pigsty. That's why it has the negative connotation that it does. Um, and, and the same thing with chicken. And so, especially meat chicken, you know, there's a lot of pastured egg producers out there, and that's great. But doing pastured meat birds is a whole different ballgame. And I think... There, there should be more conversation, more room for the poultry and the pork producers because they are such an excellent starting point for the land regeneration process. So right now at Luck Ranch, it's chicken, yep. it's pork, and it's seeds. Yep. Yep. And do you have like an area that you, and you just, you just have the first conversation in March if I'm getting this right. Right, oh, yeah. so it's, it's brand new. <laughs> and so we're really at the very we're there, beginning stages. We've only been there a few months. Yeah. <laughs> like this, that's what I'm saying. These things take a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's 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 astounding. The plan is to have sheep and cattle there. Um, sheep will come first, um, and you know it, when you get into the like the parlance of ranching, uh, generally you're like you know how many head per how many acres, um, and if you're talking about uh, lots of different animals, using the term like how many head is it, 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 it breaks down pretty quickly, and so. Sometimes people use the term animal unit, and animal unit can have multiple definitions, but we like using a thousand pounds of animal as an animal unit. Okay. okay. And so that applies to chickens, sheep, whatever it is. pigs, whatever it cattle, is. whatever it is, yep. a thousand pounds of animal is an animal unit. Yep. And yep. right now, when you're talking about overgrazed, damaged hill country, it's often like 15 to 20 acres per animal unit. I mean, that's, that's 20 acres for one cow. Yes. That's just so much land. Yeah. And so And that's with you know, that's with continuous grazing. That's like if you have that cow there year round with one big perimeter fence. There's a lot of room for improvement in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. And so There's, that's the goal is to get hopefully get sheep there in some capacity. It 
again, it depends on the rain. If we have good rains for a year, yeah. we can probably kickstart the sheep program. If we have another dry spell like we did in 2011, there's not going to be sheep on Ruck Ranch, Ruck, Ruck Ranch, <laughs> Luck Ranch it's rocky. <laughs> for, uh, for two years or three. But you guys have got yourself in a situation where it's all okay because you're not overextended. It's like you're in a position where you, you're staying within your own sustainability threshold. Yeah. We're not going to lose the farm if there's no rain. That's tremendous. Yeah, it that, really is. That's tremendous. And, and part of that is because of all these partnerships. Yeah. Um, the biggest one being our food waste pickup from Whole Foods. Um, and, you know, we, did, we haven't even talked about that yet. But, like, people are very passionate about different things. And we are very just as passionate about food waste as we are about restoring native habitat or nutrient density for people. Um, or humane treatment of animals. Food waste is incredible, and a lot of it is um, food waste created by laws that protect human health. Right. So even right. even if we even back if to human waste, health again, right? In a perverted kind of way, in a in a way that wasn't intended to help to hurt, yeah. right? Because of liability, that like you know, cold foods need to stay cold, hot foods need to stay hot. So in the chain of command issues, if you are donating from a grocery store to a food bank or any food distribution center, who's liable if someone gets sick on that food? Is it the store that cooked it, or is it the body that it was donated to and is distributing it? And pretty much, the laws now say, well, it's the person that cooked it, and you know, no, it, no company wants to take that risk, understandably. Yeah. And so it's kind of crazy, but like when you walk into a grocery store, whether it's a, a Randall's or an HEB or a Whole Foods, those hot bar lines, at the end of the day, that food is done. It's gonna go to a landfill, it's gonna decompose, it's gonna turn into methane and CO2, and that is going into the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, and so we collect that, and so we think that we have the best fed pigs, chickens, and sheep on the planet yeah. because every day they're getting like eggplant parmesan and they're getting rice pilaf and they're getting dragon fruit and kiwi and bananas. Yeah. And it's like that, I mean, that's why the pork tastes so good. Um, but we, we pick up 1,500 to 2,000 pounds every single day from four stores. And it's multiple departments. We pick up from the prepared foods department that Orion was just describing. We pick up from the dairy department so they get day old or or not even yet expired milk because they have to pull it from the shelf before the sell by date right and it's, and it's an incredible amount of waste um we get the so an important uh uh hmm, factor in this is that you cannot feed legally for health reasons um to pigs anything that is post-consumer so you can't feed scraps off of people's plates so anything that's touched a human mouth has potential pathogen transfer um, so, so the amount of food waste that we're talking about is all pre-consumer. Pre-consumer. Pre this is like yeah. half of the Maybe. puzzle. Yep. And, and it's still a monumental amount. And so you're helping Whole Foods by taking something out of their waste stream that they would have to pay to be removed. Yeah, so we're saving them lots of money. money. See, these yeah. partnerships you guys have developed are really clever and really smart. And Thank you. They're right in my wheelhouse. I love thinking like that. I love... How does this work for both parties and can we make this work so we can do it? Um, just a little bit on the secret women of agriculture, is that what it's called? The secret life of ag women is the group yeah. and um, I just mentioned it briefly. I mean it's just it's a little Facebook group that I'm a part of um, but it's really interesting to to watch and learn because these are women who work in like large-scale dairy uh, dairy operations out in Wisconsin and other places, and they're the ones doing the AI and on all these things and, and large vegetable farmers. Uh, so like women of all different uh, agricultural backgrounds. And it's just, it's been fascinating to be a part of the group because um, it's just like farming as a whole, there's, um, you know, most, most of the women on this group are conventional farmers. And so I like to plug in and like, throw out, well, this is what I'm doing on my regenerative farm, and they'll scratch their heads and be like, that's really interesting. And and just a quick thing that I'll mention, we collect all this food waste with an electric vehicle because we are very passionate about climate change and carbon emissions. And as we were picking up this food waste, we were using our diesel truck, our F-150, to do this run. And eventually we were actually doing it with an F-350 because it became so much. Uh, and, and we were just 
pumping CO2 into the atmosphere by collecting this food waste, kind of like it's negating the whole purpose. And so finally we were like, okay, Orion came up with this idea. He's like, so we need to look into an electric vehicle that can do this. And when you go into that, the only vehicle that can tow this amount of poundage is a Tesla Model X. Um, which is, you know, $110,000 luxury car. And he's like, I think we need to buy a Tesla, a Model X. <laughs> and I'm just like, excuse me? Like, Come again? for the farm? And yeah. he's like, yeah. And we went, but we ran the numbers. And because of the cost savings in the, the diesel, um, it actually ended up being, when you when you factor in, because we're doing a an 80-mile uh, loop right. every yeah. day. Uh, when you yeah. factor in the the Haul, hauling five thousand pounds, 5, eighty pounds. miles, every, yeah. every day, every single day. Yeah, and if you were to do that with the truck, that's like 10, 11 miles per gallon of diesel. Right. So what's uh, the ROI on that? So when you the Tesla versus the the F three fifty, was it take two years, uh, four years? The payback is uh, I thought it would be three and a half years. Um, but we're actually putting on more miles than I even thought. So it's basically three years, uh, a return on investment where we are now making money because we're driving the electric vehicle. Yeah. Um, but it is a higher output and it was a bit of a leap of faith because we had been paying uh, between 500 and $550 a month in the diesel to, to make that run. And you know, like we're saving an incredible amount on hog feed. Um, so it was, it was totally worth it, even if we were just paying $550 a month in diesel. But like, it killed me every mile to be like, man, I am burning diesel into the atmosphere right now. Um, and so the only way we could pull it off was by lobbying our credit union to say, hey, will you finance this luxury car for our farm work? <laughs> and they're like, are you insane? And we were like, right. yes. We are insane, but it makes yeah. sense. <laughs> the reason I got onto the quick tangent about the Teslas, I'm also part of a group of like women owning Teslas. And so it's interesting, like the, the parallel of like women owning Teslas, women in the ag industry. And it's just fascinating to watch like how they, they each have their own stories about how people will react to the fact that they're a woman doing these things. And they're like, oh, so what does your husband do? And that's why you own a Tesla. It's like, no, 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 this is, this is my we are, Tesla. We are farmers. Uh, or, you know, we are farmers and we own a Tesla. And they're just like, what? And, and the same thing in the, the ag group where people will talk about, these women will talk about the challenges that they have with these industrial breeds that they're working with, for example, and all start to talk about the heritage breeds and the, the different challenges that we have, but also these are much more robust. And so it's it's been a great conversation to have. Um, and I think also women are just a bit more receptive um, to these new ideas and new thoughts and new ways of doing things. And so it's been really rewarding for me to plug into those communities and be like, hey, here's a new way that we could possibly do all of this. And, and they're willing to listen. And 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 I would bet there's going to be some change rippling through that those ponds that you're that you're working in that could be very, very effective. You all, you all are inspiring to me. Um, I, I really, really appreciate what you've chosen to do with your life and the reasons you're doing it. And, and, and it just seems like the world is reflecting back to you a really nice, like, hey, keep going, keep going. We want you to keep doing what you're doing. But let's go ahead and do a proper wrap out for our second Carbon Cowboys Conversations with, uh, with Tina and Orion Weldon at Terra Prezza. Kind of close, yeah. kind of <laughs> close. And we wish you all the best luck, um, but luck comes to those who work hard. So you guys are working hard. Thank you so much for being with us today. It was our honor, Peter. Yeah, thank you so much for, you. for the conversation.